Welcome to Deeply Rooted. I'm Jeremiah Reiner, your host, and thank you guys for joining us. Can't believe we're saying this, but this is actually episode 100. It feels like yesterday we just got started, but here we are. Episode 100 about to be put in the books. We've got a really neat guest lined up for us this afternoon, so I'm really, really excited about this conversation. Before we get into it, don't forget, head on over to our YouTube channel and on Apple Podcasts. Make sure you hit that subscribe button. Leave us a review. That'll help us out a lot getting uh, different listeners and getting the word out there about the ministry here at Deeply Rooted. You can also head on over to our Facebook group page and join us there as well and keep up with all things Deeply Rooted. And if you really want to, you can dive into our website. That's at deeplyrootedpodcast.com. We've got our blog post on there, all of our archived episodes, which will take you directly to the YouTube channel and some upcoming ministry schedule as well if you want to find out where we're at in the area. Now, that being said, you can find us as well with our email at drigw18 at gmail.com. Again, that's drigw18 at gmail.com. So if you've got any questions, prayer requests, anything like that, send us that. And we'd love to be able to pray with you and correspond with you and answer any questions you might have. So that being said, this is going to be a fun one. Um, years ago, as I was searching around the old Twitter machine there, I ran across this gentleman and I could not have been more excited about this, but uh, we've landed a pretty big fish here for episode 100, so we're excited. And I'm going to read his Twitter bio for you here. So before we get started, this is sort of the introduction to the loving pastor. But he's the pastor of No Hope Independent Baptist Church of Bitter End, Tennessee. He's loving the flock. He's tightening the Bible belt and just trying to share what's on his blessed God heart. And you can find him at his Twitter handle. It's at Loving Pastor, and I think he might be recognized most as the world-famous leader of the Piggly Wiggly Revival, according to his account. So, uh, LP, is it okay if I call you that tonight? Yes, sir. Well, man, I appreciate you being on. Thank you so much. Uh, oh, it's a treat to be here. Thank you for having me. Now, we can dive into this really quickly, but I think to catch everybody up to speak, is we've probably got some listeners that may or may not be on Twitter so just to sort of, you know, catch everybody up here, how in the world did this whole parody account come about? Well, uh, it was, a, at the time it began, it was a, uh, we would say, a joint effort uh, in the beginning stages, but it's been mostly me, uh, say, for the last, I think, was it... Uh, Four years or five, I think we've been doing it. It's been mostly me carrying the carrying the load and carrying the burden. But uh, it actually was just how it started. In, in case any of your followers don't understand what a non or anonymous accounts yeah. are, uh, they are uh, they can be built for multiple reasons. You know, some people do them as uh, they call it trolling or whatever it may be, where you go and just aggravate people and cause a big ruckus. Uh, the Love and Pastor account is created as a parody to run parallel with real life, you right. know, to take real life things that you see and just run side by side with it for comedy's sake, basically. Uh, but also to point out some truths, maybe maybe someone would look at it and think, that's kind of, make you think about it, you know. Um, so contrary to a lot of people's beliefs, uh, the Loving Pastor was not created to tear down preachers, and it was, I'll tell you what it was not before I tell you what it was, <laughs> what it is. It was not created to tear down preachers or ministries. Um, it was not to uh, hurt people's feelings, and uh, and these are all things I've been accused of. But, right. uh, and it was not created for me or whoever to vent uh, personal vendettas or anything like that. I actually was birthed out of the idea of we would see uh, preachers on their Facebook pages who would basically give their flock a good shearing on Monday <laughs> for for lack of uh, participation in Sunday services. So, for instance, you get on Facebook and you see some preacher you know that goes, really appreciated seeing all the empty seats yesterday at church. It was real fun preaching by myself. And then at the end, the pastor would say, love y'all. You know, it was like completely against what he just said. Or, or some of y'all, it was nice to see you mowing your grass while I went home on Wednesday afternoon, you know, while I was going to church. And then he'd be like, love y'all, praying for you. And we were seeing people <laughs> doing this constantly and just thought it was so funny, you know, that they were doing this. Uh, so we, or if you was to scroll back and look at the loving pastor from the beginning, you'd see those first 
number of tweets were just that kind of stuff, you know, just weird kind of, yeah. you know, things that things that you wouldn't think a preacher says, but maybe they really do. Uh, that was kind of what it was. But then, uh, then came along screen recording, and up until that point, you know, if you've seen something weird on YouTube or Facebook, I don't even think Facebook Live was functioning at that point when we started, but, you know, if you've seen some weird something going on at church, you'd have to send a link to YouTube and say, watch to the 15-minute mark or go to the 15-minute mark. Right. But when screen screen recording came along and, like, the Apple, which I use iPhone, but when they started offering that, then you could actually just record what was going on at the moment you seen. Yeah. And comes to find out I have a gift of clipping <laughs> for video clipping. <laughs> so uh, originally it started out with just kind of playing around like, you know, you see one preacher kind of going after another preacher. And, you know, at first I was just clipping those segments together to make the preacher sound like he was saying something that he really wasn't. It wasn't trying to take a guy out of context. It was just what they call video mashing or like you've seen bad lip syncing or anything else. It was just kind of fun clips, you know, and, and laughing at things I had did myself, too. But then it became more for me a real, uh, I guess, a hurt or a shock at what was really going on in pulpits and the things that were being preached as gospel or as Bible. And then, you know, of course, then the tide kind of turned for me. Really, the tide turned for me uh, watching Burlington Revival clips, and I'm not dropping that to criticize them. I'm just saying what i seen happening there really took me in a different turn to I became more focused on uh, guys that were offering oddball-type altar calls and, right. and things and preaching and the things that they were doing, the shenanigans and the skits and all that stuff. Then I really started focusing a lot on that, you know, in mixed with my Piggly Wiggly Revival. So, <laughs> so the Piggly Wiggly Revival broke out, and that really just catapulted, you know, a big, a big move for the account. And um, if they don't know what the Piggly Wiggly Revival is... Yeah, let everybody in on that a little bit, because I think they might be a little off base there. So what is the Piggly Wiggly <laughs> Revival? Yeah, the Piggly Wiggly Revival was a revival that broke out uh, between when it was me, the loving pastor, and a Bible Belt satire, we were we were down at the Piggly Wiggly. That's a <laughs> that's a grocery store for those of you guys who don't know. And uh, a lady named Sister Edna was there, and she knocked over a case of Welch's non fermented grape juice. <laughs> and as it hit the floor and started spreading across the floor, there was a spirit of revival that broke out in there that day because it was the non fermented grape juice, <laughs> like Jesus, like Jesus served. And uh, we just started seeing, you know, we seen uh, I think it was cashiers was turned in their nose rings and uh, repenting. And uh, we had some guys in the meat department that got rid of all their beer they had hit out in their car. And it just, it just took off from there. And we've been, I think we've been running five, five or six years now. That <laughs> five last. So that's, that's where I was earlier. I was trying to get all the offering counted and uh, <laughs> make sure I had a full tank of gas before I got on here tonight. But, yeah, so it, it was, it's been a great revival. We've had a lot, a lot of good things come out of it. So it's really got out of the banks for you guys, right? <laughs> oh, man, it's been out of the banks, burned the barn down, the gully washer, the whole nine yards. It's been a, it's been a really big meeting. I think the best one I heard so far is it's run the devil's corn knee high. So I think <laughs> <laughs> Well, we usually go out there. We shuck the corn sometimes. Yeah. We like to get in the briar patches. <laughs> And we have people that hold the mule. We hold. We have to hold each other's mule while the other one takes a lap or something. Yeah. I don't know. It's been it's been pretty wild out there. We do we do everything a charismatic would do, but we're not charismatic. <laughs> <laughs> now, what kind of feedback have you guys got? I'm sure there's been a lot of positive. Obviously, like me reaching out and having a good laugh. But I'm I'm sure you guys have also seen some pretty hateful things. Um. Well, I mean, you know, I get it. Uh, I would say that I would say it's mostly positive. Okay. I don't, I mean, I've had people, most people would think that I'm bitter. Um, and, 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 it, and it all, I mean, basically, and this is not anything to, and you can take this out if you want to, whatever, but anytime I post CT is when I, re, I receive the most flack, CT Townsend. And that's, that's just the way it's been from the get go. Yeah. If I could post, any number of people doing any number of crazy things, and I get nothing. I mean, 
But if I was to post anything he does questionable or unquestionable, or whether they say it's um, that I took it out of context or whatever it may be, I get that's the only person that I've gotten kicked back over. Yeah. Um, you know, and I and I've been honest with those people too, and and CT knows who who I am, um, and I've not I have no intention of destroying any person's ministry, uh, and it's obvious that I can't do that that. Anonymous accounts are not capable of destroying anyone's ministry. I mean, if anybody believes that, they obviously are not online and understand the power that a pastor with a social media presence has. Mm. Um, You cannot stifle. If they're good on social media, if they're good on the platform, if they're good entertaining, you can't slow that down. It wouldn't matter. I mean, I've posted things that are these guys done that was basically – so close to being heretical or at least so close to being anti-Christ in the way that it's presented. Not that they're anti-Christ, but I'm saying it's not the way the gospel should be presented. Sure. Um, and it, it, people don't even blink an eye to that. Mm. But, you know, you say one thing about a guy snapping his fingers and calling people down to the altar and they're up in arms that, you know, quit, quit criticizing. So, I mean, you know, to each is their own. And I, I, you know, but I have made a ton of good friends. And a lot of good people that I think question uh, a lot of people that follow a, an anonymous account, or let's say check in, they may not follow it because they're afraid somebody will see that they follow <laughs> or like it. You know, they don't want anybody to know that. But um, I've had a lot of people that will that will say, I appreciate you, or not appreciate, but they'd say, I really started thinking about this after you through whatever it means, whether it be, was it a joke? Was it parody? Was it just a, here's a clip? Cause occasionally I'll do that. I'll be like, all right, here's a clip. You discern this, see yeah. what you think of this. You know, not, not my opinion. Just look at this and see, does this look biblical to you? Does this right. appear biblical to you? Um, you know, but I'd say really over the last year and a half or two, really when the car horns started coming out during COVID, <laughs> you know, I think a lot of people seen that I was not, uh, I mean, I'm, I, I am, I am lighthearted. I don't have, sure. I really do not have an agenda to hurt anyone. You know, uh, a lot of times posting this stuff, I'm thinking I ain't doing nothing but hurting myself because the people that know me think I'm, there's something wrong with me, I guess, you know, to an extent, but they like my jokes, but they can't believe that I'd question anything and again these are things that i've been a part of my whole life yeah i don't feel like i'm on the outside looking in i feel like uh it's a part of who i am that has been ripped away by people hijacking what i call hijacking old-time religion because the old-time religion i grew up in didn't do these things now they did some of them but they didn't do all the wide variety of things that are being offered out there right now well, that being said, that kind of leads us into what I really wanted to dive into tonight. And you and I had conversations, obviously, before we recorded over the phone and different things. And, and we come from a fairly similar background, albeit maybe, you know, slight generation apart. But how serious would you say that currently right now, because we know this has been going on a while, but like right now, how serious would you say in our region this unbiblical, almost manipulative style of pastoring and evangelism is? I I think it's really serious. Um, And that's part of the reason I continue on, because I really do hope that some people can get beyond uh, their traditional way that they think things ought to be and the way that they've always had it and understand that there is a variant out there right now that looks and appears to be what they've always known, but it is not what they've always known. And what the problem is, is they have quit teaching and preaching the gospel. Yeah. Now they're telling the same stories. And I I use this phrase a lot. Like they, these are the stories evangelists are made of, or these are the evangelist stories are made of. You can inter, inter, interchange <laughs> it. And it, what it means is you tell a story about a guy long enough till he becomes a hero. Mm. He becomes, uh, they do this with Percy Ray. And I think Percy Ray was a fine individual and probably a fine preacher. I've heard his messages. But if you'll, if you're in this area of the circle of people that I know, he becomes almost legendary to the point that you worship this person Mm. that you become. And they they would never agree to that. 
but you can't tell me that they don't because they try to pattern everything that they do after him and not the gospel. Right. They mix in people's personalities, and we all have personalities, and we all have uh, we have our quirky ways, and we all have things about us that we are. That's the greatness of being individuals in the kingdom. We're not all the same. But if you're not careful, everybody tries to copy what this guy did to get this same uh, outcome or this same produce the same results. Uh, and I think that's dangerous. But overall, in the question that you're saying, the most dangerous part is that, that I think they're skipping out actually preaching the gospel inside of that. Yeah. They say gospel, and you'll hear catchphrases that you've always it's not catchphrases, it's truth, but, you know, that you must be born again, you know, the virgin birth, all the things that we consider essentials to come into Christ and putting our faith in Him. And they'll say those things, but it, you hear a lot of other stuff mixed in that I think to a seasoned Christian sends up red flags. But the problem is, generation of people that I know, 40s, 30s, it don't give them no red flags. They just absorb it and move along. Yeah. One thing I heard recently from an individual, he said, uh, he said that his church, uh, he was talking about a church, and I think it was his church. He said, I don't think our people care what happened or what is preached as long as we have good services. And what he was meaning was good services was that God moves in or the big preacher shows up and we don't have no preaching. And I said, isn't that scary to think that people who supposedly believe the gospel or they believe in the teaching of the Bible don't care what is preached as long as they can have this emotional high or this mm. experience because if they are okay with if that's what your goal is then that means you'll listen to anything yeah you'll you'll hear anything and you'll accept it and I think that's where we're at right now we're on the edge of full-blown wild things being taught from our pulpits because nobody's saying hold up guys is this really right or what yeah. we're saying? Nobody's questioning anything. Well, with that being said, let's break it down by category here because I would like to look at some things that I think people need to be aware of because, like you said, there is a real issue going on. Whether people want to admit it or not, it's definitely out there. Obviously, your account is, is playing into that and exposing some of that in a you know a lighthearted kind of way and sometimes, albeit a sad way too, like when certain things come across there. But... Let's look at one here, and again, we'll just go down the list here of some things that I think it would be best that people are aware of. And one of those would be the idea that it seems like a lot of this is just wrapped around the idea that they're not trusting God to do the work. And what I mean by that, and you can talk to some of these, for example, like altar call manipulation tactics or storytelling even if it's false just exaggerated over the top storytelling and like you mentioned a moment ago the emotionalism this euphoric high that people are looking for um, talk a little bit about the idea of the lack of trusting god to literally do the work here as opposed to trying to make it man-based yeah i think you know i always think the bible says his word will not return void. So, so we have that promise. Mm. There's no, there's no, there's no reason that a man has to do anything beyond give that word, preach that word. Um, but a lot of times, I think they feel like it falls on deaf ears. I think originally a lot of this didn't start out the way that it has turned to now. Um, but I see through clipping and watching multiple guys online, and I've been in on myself. Uh, I grew up in churches where, around services where, you know, you get to the end, you start singing just as I am, and the preacher says, I feel like somebody here needs to make a move. And he may feel that way. I, I have no idea. I mean, I'm sure I'm not a preacher. I, I, I'm sure a man carries a burden, burden when he preaches to, you know, uh, see someone saved, and I do. You know, I guess you sense that, and you can sense conviction on people. I believe that. Sure. But like you said, when he takes that next step and he starts coaching people yeah. into that, um, you know, I can remember a day when my circle of old time religion used to say, 
oh, we couldn't go to that go up there to that church. They they round up all the kids and ask them if they want to be saved, and then they pronounce them saved. But now you go to an old fashioned tent revival, and the evangelist gets up, and at the end he goes, "All right, I want every head bowed and every eye closed." All right, now what is this? Is the beginning of the rounding up? Yeah. So anybody in here who's felt anything, we want you to raise your hand. He don't say it that way, but what he says is. If you feel this pounding, or you feel this tug, or you feel... And those are all elements of conviction, for sure. I mean, unsettledness, I mean, or it could have had a fight with their boyfriend or girlfriend that day, or it could have been stress from school, or... I mean, you know, there, yeah. there's there's a whole list of things that could be bothering people when you come to that place. And then, what's bothered me of late, though, that I've, I see changing is... Um, there's a tactic used, and I don't know if they're talking about it to one another or if it's just something they've seen someone do, but it's the finger snapping. Yeah. Uh, and that you've seen it shared on my account, and that's just not one person. I'm seeing that coming out of like four and five right. different guys now. So once you get them into that, and I call it like a psychological state of, of being, they're really owned in on what the preacher's saying. Then he pops those fingers, and it's like it's just clicking, like a like a rhythmic yeah. click, almost leads you into some type of hypnosis kind of feeling. I'm not saying they're doing it, but I'm just telling you what it would appear if you were on the outside looking yeah. in. And then the commands to do this, do this, do this, counting then, down. I see that a lot. You know, on the yeah, count of three. Here's count the down. Snaps. Well, then, well, yeah. then we're going to go. We're going to go. You. I, my prayer won't save you. That's what they'll say, and that's true. So that element of it is true. But then they say, but pray this prayer. Well, I don't think I know what I prayed when I called on God to save me. All I know is that I was in need of Him. You know, I, I believe my conversion experience, probably the enlightenment of actually what had happened come years later, I mean, as you become more mature in, sure. in the Word and things. But... For something to happen so quick like that, and then, and sure, you can have Damascus Road experience. You can have Ethiopian eunuch experience. That can happen. Those are all experiences for those individuals. And I'm sure there are people who walk into tents, never heard the gospel, hear it, and are miraculously saved. But is it two and 3,000 of them? Mm. Where do they all go? Yeah. Why, why are they not in church? Why is there not a? My question is, if two thousand and some people are saved over the course of a month or two, should there not be tons of churches? Yeah. Should there not be some kind of church growth? Where are these people at? And people and then, are going to hear then, that what you just said and act as if you're making those numbers up. These are what's being reported. I mean, you and I know oh, this. No. Like you can find it no. all over online. This is what is being reported by people. Literal numbers. In the if thousands. they don't, right, and if they want to see that, they're more welcome to go to Love and Pastor at Twitter. Right. <laughs> and I have it broke down there uh, where an evangelist that's been preaching less than uh, six years is claiming to have seen a hundred and some thousand people yeah. saved. And if you and I posted it on there, if you just do the math, he's averaging twenty two thousand people saved a year. Hmm. I mean, this is Billy Graham crusade numbers, like larger than. And most, you know, I don't even know how many people, I ain't got a problem with Billy Graham. I ain't saying nothing about him. I'm just saying, even back in those days, the old past movement would, was total disapproval of him calling people down like that and just, right. you know, pronouncing them saved. Pronounce, you're saved. Come down front. You're saved. Come down front. And what we've done, we're, we're doing that again in our churches. And I, and for your listeners, it's not old past. We don't even understand anything about that. A lot of this ain't going to make any sense, but... Uh, I mean, it's just what I grew up in and what I was around. Sure. I mean, I grew up in where, you know, an environment where they believed the Holy Spirit drew men to Christ. Sure. And they would still do that with lip service and say, we believe the Holy Spirit knows that. But then again, they're telling people to pray this prayer. So it, it's just, to me, it's hypocritical because, I mean, we know the Word will do the work that needs to be yeah. done. And we pray that the Holy Spirit draw men unto Him, unto Christ, right. that, that, that He come and do the work. And no one will be saved unless the Holy Spirit does that. And 
But for us to think that we can set the atmosphere by playing mood music and having the lights down and, you know, having people repeat after me, I think is just damaging. I think it's yeah. just horrid to, to what everyone has has done in the past to try to be honest and bring in the gospel to people that men are lost, that there's no way to heaven, but through Jesus Christ. And the only way they're going to hear that is through the preaching of the gospel. And then we want to say, but then we're going to sing this song for 45 minutes or we're going to, do, it, 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 it skips it. You yeah. know what I'm saying? It just, it takes it. It's like, it's, you're looking at it. Here's the gospel, but I'm going to throw a handful of something else in here to make it work. And I, I think that's, long term really damaging for not just our churches right now but the future generation of kids that are saved and confused by this yeah look at how many make two and three professions before they ever hit college right and then they're going to go off and actually be more exposed to worldly ideas and thinking and i don't know that they know or understand what's going on yeah even for me personally as a minister one of the biggest things I see, and, and you sort of touched on this, the, the manipulation tactics, I would I would almost label it reverse psychology. You'll the, Again, they'll give lip service to the idea that, yes, the Holy Spirit is the only one that can draw. But then it's as if, let's handcuff the Holy Spirit and let me show you how to do this. And you'll hear lingo like, now I'm not going to come to you because that's not what I do. Yep. But then that turns into, let me give you a horror story about what happened to somebody that walked out of here one time and yep. ended up losing their life. And so now they're going to yeah. get you in this emotional fear state, or they'll tell a personal story about themselves. Again, totally negated the scriptures, have never went back to anything according to Bible. And now they get into, after that, it's going to be the finger snapping and the counting and the you know, the manipulation to come to them. Remember, they're not coming to you, but they'll do everything they can to get you to come to them. And I just think that's, to me personally, that seems like trying to reverse psychologically manipulate somebody into what I would call a false conversion. I agree with you completely. And, it, and uh, you know, I've one thing I think that has changed uh, probably in the last five to six years is it happens more so now with the what I call the good service. And the good service is where there's no preaching, mm. which becomes even more questionable because now they'll, I would say there was no word preached or no gospel given. Now, some would argue and say, well, that song had the gospel in it. Or, you know, the preacher got up and said, you must be born again. I'm going to give you this opportunity to come down. And that's a form of the gospel. Sure, I guess. But I believe faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. And if there is, and they could have heard the word. And I know the, I, hear, I can hear the guys now that, <laughs> yeah. that don't like me or don't like whatever I'm saying. Uh, and I'm no scholar. Let me point that out. I am no scholar. I mean, I'm just talking to you honestly. As if I was talking to, I mean, I, this first time I've ever met you, I was in a phone call. And I'm telling you honestly how I feel about these things. I'm not trying to uh, convince you or your listeners of a certain way. Sure. I mean, you have to decide that yourself. You can't. I've got friends that totally disagree with me the way I feel about a lot of these men and their ministries. And I'm still their friend. They're still my friend. And I had never tried to convince them otherwise. But I have always been honest to state this is very questionable. And I think that's the good thing about what you're doing here is that why don't we think about this a little bit? Does this make sense? Does this Is this good for us going forward? Yeah. Um, and it's not. I mean, I, I'm fully convinced that it's not. But this, where there's no actual Bible preached, and then you can get everyone into an emotional state, and do the finger snapping, do the calling everyone down to the altar, whatever it may be. And now they don't even call them down to the altar. They have them to stand in their place. And like you said, they'll say, I'm not going to embarrass you. I wouldn't come to you. Right. And, and, and and automatically, I know people that are listening to this, or you've got a guy, a picture of whoever's doing this in your head. But there's more than one man doing this. Oh, this, yeah. is, this is becoming, because one man is popular and it works for him, then they all start following suit right down the line. Well, if this worked for him, let me try this and see how this works. And then you've got, you know, people making professions in the in the pew that don't even really know what they did other than just listen to what the preacher said. And then they're really confused why in two or three years 
their churches are revolving doors of in and out people. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I'm not the judge of who's saved and who's lost. Clearly, uh, we know that from Scripture that, that God has the say on that. But uh, we do know that you know by the fruits, sure. and you know by their fruits, if they come and go, they were never part of us. I mean, that's we know that from the Word too. And uh, that don't mean they didn't like our preferences or way we dressed with the songs we sing. There was something wrong initially from the from the birthing process. Yeah. That's basically what's what was wrong there. Because um, I think I've heard it said there's actually really no false conversions. They're just, they wouldn't ever <laughs> converted right. to begin right. with, you know. Yeah. I mean, and so uh, those are good questions that, I mean, those are good things that we, they should be addressed. But a lot of yeah. people are just afraid to, afraid somebody will, and I've already been threatened, you know, people are going to get me, so I ain't scared to, <laughs> people know who the people that know who I am know who I am and they I guess if they wanted to uh, do a mafia hit on my car it already been over with <laughs> well speaking of other things to address one of the other topics that I wanted to touch on here and this one I'll be honest with you this one baffles me because even growing up you know I, I was you know I want to say fortunate enough to see some things but I <laughs> was around enough to to catch some very unique individuals from time to time filling pulpits and certain services that I just look back on and I you know almost in in awe but the language that you hear today from some of these individuals and I don't mean like charismatic language of oh wow look at their ability to spin a phrase I'm talking about abusive vulgar literally cursing in the pulpit um how how much of that have you come across in your findings just through this account really only two men uh the predominant one uh do you want me to say his name or you want to keep that off yeah that's fine because here's the bottom Uh, line people need to know i've come to this conclusion because again we're not trying to do a hit piece here but i do want people to understand there are boundaries and there have been some people in our area that have absolutely crossed them and are not even looking back anymore. But yeah, I'm, I'm fine with you mentioning that. Yeah. So Phil Kidd, Dr. Right. Dr. Mr. Phil Kidd is, uh, you know, I hadn't, I had never heard of this guy till, till the anon count was created. Uh, I can't remember. Somebody turned me on to, I guess, seeing what kind of material I was producing comedy wise and was like, you should watch this guy. And so I started following his account. And for the most part, it's just uh, silly tongue-in-cheek stuff he says from the pulpit. You yeah. know, it, wouldn't, it would maybe a group of 50, 60-year-olds would find comedic. I mean, he does have some funny things he does say from time to time. But I think the first time I heard him use H-E-double-L, you know, I'm not, you know, I'm <laughs> I'm brainwashed not to cuss at all, so <laughs> I can't hardly say it. Yeah. I can't even say it in a, uh, uh, my parents, you know, beat that out of me, I guess. I never, was never part of my life, but anyway. It wouldn't be good um, for the Piggly Wiggler if I, oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, I don't want to hurt anything. I don't want to hurt any of my followers there. Yeah. But, you know, it is, yeah, it's a Bible word for sure. Uh, but the way that he uses it, in his message is what we would call in the slang sure. or in the in the cursing way of it, you know. Um, and you know, the first few times I heard it, I was kind of shocked. But then he went on to use uh, a lot of homophobic type things, call it, uh, talking about men being neutered and uh, really crude yeah. stuff from the pulpit, and has even used the f word in not the f bomb, but in the um, F R E A, F R E A K I N G. You know yeah. that, and I'm not. I don't know who listens to this, so I'm not going to say any of that. So, not that I think that's a horrible word, but it's really uh, bold to use from the pulpit. And the fact that you're representing as a messenger of Jesus Christ, or you're breaking His word to His sheep, uh, just really crude and um, uncalled for behind the pulpit. And if it doesn't shock someone then i don't know what uh and maybe that's the purpose of him doing it it's just shock and all but i've heard that he's done that for you can look on youtube and find people criticizing him years ago for mm. for saying those kind of things from the pulpit i don't think it's anything new as far as that goes from him uh the shock and all 
aspect of how he preaches. But uh, and then I've heard one other guy that uh, more local to where I am uh, that he he will go he will almost say stuff and then he'll pull back and he'll go oh almost said that mm. and if you do that then you basically let them know what you're what say but I've sure. talked to uh, matter of fact. Another guy that has an account on Twitter here, uh, he seems like a pretty decent guy. You know, just he's not anonymous, but just in sharing with him that I found out over the last few years that many pastors, preachers, evangelists use that kind of language in their personal life. And it's just been, it was really heartbreaking to me at first uh, to think, you know, I was I was under the impression, and no preacher's better than anyone else. I, sure. mean, I don't I don't believe that, and I don't believe he's held to uh, a higher standard as far as me and him that there's anything me or him one shouldn't do different from the other. I mean, he is as far as what the Bible teaches in Timothy and Titus. He has requirements to hold his position, but as a man, he's a man just like anyone else. Um, but you know, to think that your preacher's cursing, it just seems kind of odd to me. And I know that that's really old fashioned, I guess, to a lot of people, but I think there's an element to it that, you know, they think they should be dressed in a suit and tie, but yet they can say words like this from the pulpit. That's, that's not right. I mean, that don't seem right to me. It has, it has major hypocritical connotations. Right. And some of the things you mentioned, even worse, the language towards women, that I've heard the language towards oh, yes. teenagers, particularly teenage girls that yeah. I thought was, I'll be honest. I thought was absolutely condemning. I mean, at times for what they would said and the saddest part that I see. And again, you've seen this as well. So I'm, I'm preaching to the choir here, the applause and the celebration from yeah. the people yeah. in the audience and the congregation when this is said, I mean, it's almost enough to put your jaw on the floor to think about that people are literally a manning this, that they're getting behind it, and then we'll walk out and clarify that as, quote, great preaching. Right. When, personally speaking, I believe the Bible absolutely condemns it. Um, yeah. There's no accountability for it, and sadly it's celebrated in a lot of circles. And again, I mean, we're talking about a guy who I'm, I'm five minutes down the road. I mean, I don't care to admit that, you know, and it's a... It's a thing here in my neck of the woods that it's becoming alarming, you know, to the point that I'm I'm very discouraged by that. Um, I'm discouraged by the number of people that I think are being led astray, and and not enough people have called this out. And my question is, where where is the congregation holding this accountable, or is there? I don't know. Maybe maybe it's just not something that's in their DNA to do that, but it's well, I discouraging. Know with, with, with Phil, he tends to lead us people that would view online that uh he is a special minister to people who are rough like that's what he wants you or wants us to think i've heard him say if you've not got tattoos if you've not been in jail or punched your wife in the nose you, you don't belong in our congregation well i mean those people have a place in any congregation i'm sure but they're if they're christians they're separated from that now not tattoos or i'm just saying they're not gonna beat their wife or sure. call their wife's name or we're not gonna be okay with that and i don't think kid would condone that action but in the same sense he's calling women uh vulgar or nasty names from the pulpit and nobody in his congregation has an issue with that that's yeah. that's troublesome i mean what do you do with that and then you know you said you've seen people stand and cheer and again, this will be the people who think I'm just out to tear someone down. But I've posted other pastors or preacher telling his wife shot someone the bird, and the, yeah. the whole crowd got up and cheered. Yeah, I mean that floors me. That that seems beyond anything Christian I've ever been taught or exposed to in my entire life. Now, do Christians do that? Sure. The Christians do every. Christians are capable of anything and everything that lost people do. I mm. mean, they're capable. And there's going to be mistakes made. I'm sure I'm not better than anyone. I don't believe that. No one, everybody's capable of anything. But at the same time, do we cheer for it? Do we? What, that don't make sense. I mean. Yeah, where's the self-control? You know, where's the holiness know. aspect I, I of it? it? I don't, I just don't understand that, you know. No, it don't register with me. We'll put it that way. And I may, I may be the one at fault. Maybe I need to think it's okay to air out that kind of laundry in front of people, and then everybody 
be okay with that, you know. Now, you know, I wouldn't share, you know, if I had to, if I had to, do, if I, if there was something like that going on with me, I would get me and my wife to help and probably keep it quiet from that point, unless it became something, uh, something that uh, was a, a bother to the congregation or the people that I served with. But you know, it almost the odd thing about this, and one of my friends pointed out to me, it's like these men use those stories to become uh, legends or to become the 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 joke of yeah. the situation. You know, I mean, kid kid gets almost tickled at himself telling. <laughs> You know, when he says certain things and you're thinking, that don't make any sense. What's, why are you doing that? You know, I don't know, you know, and people may look at me or you, either one, probably me and think I'm just strange or odd, but it it just is not what I was raised under what it is now. Um, And there was many aspects to what I was raised under that had questionable tactics or motives, I guess. But I do believe people used to generally be concerned with people hearing the gospel and being converted and trusting in Christ. Now, with social media, it's like a constant competition to who can post the most people saved, who's got the biggest ministry, who's got... And I think they were always people like that. They just couldn't have the quick access to put it out there. Right. Well, that being said, I want to piggyback off of that, talking about, you know... the lack of concern really it seems like anymore for the high reverence of scripture and i want to talk about the the twisting of scripture that you see a lot and this is something i've noticed you've posted quite a bit before and i've seen other accounts and guys mentioning this but a a clear lack of exposition um as you've mentioned already it's not very gospel centered it's lazy sermon prep, in my opinion. Again, I'm, I'm talking as a minister here. I can just see through that. That is very lazy sermon preparation. And then the other thing that's crept in, particularly over the last handful of years, the politically driven, politically obsessed preaching that we're seeing anymore um, that is taking passages completely out of context, almost just for hit pieces, it, it almost seems like this is fully designed to just rouse a congregation and just be total red meat to a group of people. But um, what say you? Like, have you come across that quite a bit, just the total manipulation of Scripture? Yeah, I would I would think, or I think in the guys that I follow or post the most, I don't see as much um, manipulating it, meaning where they take something and— uh, don't actually preach what's there uh, in, in regards to totally making it say something that it didn't say, but I, I think they like to think of something they want to say and then find a text to fit it. Yeah. Kind of backwards, you know, well, I want to preach on this subject, so I'm going to find a text or a story, and it's mostly Old Testament stories that they use, but they'll find something in the Old Testament, a king or something that they want to use, and they'll take that, and then they'll spin it to fit whatever story they're wanting to preach on. Yeah. Whatever. And I think that's probably happened for years. I mean, I, I figure that's that's been there's been men over the years who were good men that really wasn't uh, trained well to preach as far as uh, what we call correctly, uh, but they did the best they could. But I think, like you say now, I think it's a lot of laziness up there, and. Um, I know for a fact in the ones that I've seen that politically driven messages are hot tickets for hits on social media. Oh, yeah. I mean, uh, there's another preacher in Tennessee that does really well or did build his whole name off of uh, politically driven stuff. But the end of his cuckoo ness is just, I mean, you know, he's casting out demons now on a weekly basis. And... Because you eventually run out of stuff, ideas, if you're not going to actually preach what's there. Right. Line upon line, verse upon verse. You're just not, you're, you have to come up with something that, that recharges people because most people do not enjoy just hearing the word taught and preached. I mean, they, they just, uh, it's boring to them. And that goes back to the whole thing. Of, it makes you wonder what they even believe if they find scripture boring. But and and also in the same like you're you're saying there the laziness of the preparation, 
they it works better for most men to come up with an idea and just get a story and then or get a get a biblical passage that kind of fits what they're wanting to talk about and then just tell stories about their life right and and or something has happened to them or their family or their kids and there's nothing wrong with the illustrations i mean that can be that's part of preaching but if your whole thing is built off that and props and pieces of you know stuff you've seen and done your whole life then i think you're missing the actual gospel inside of the text you're just and i'm you know people are probably gonna murder me when they hear this because <laughs> i mean i'm not i'm not a preacher and i don't claim to be a scholar but i have heard lots of good preaching and i know when a man is expounding the text right. and i know when a man is dancing around expound expound the text and i know when a man don't want to preach the text but he wants to rant about whatever is bothering him. yeah and i know when a man don't want to preach at all and he wants the service to get out i can tell you those things i, I know when they're doing those things and if people don't people in a lot of people in the pews especially if they don't go outside of their church they really don't know the difference between the actual move of God and if their preacher just didn't bother to study that week or if he was gone all week preaching somewhere and didn't want to come back and just if he just want to come back and give them some leftovers. That's that's what's going on and they don't know it. And most of them are satisfied with that. That's the problem. That's a big problem. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Of of all the things it produces, and it's a lot. Trust me, there's there's plenty of bad we could talk about from from just terrible or lack of exposition. To me, the biggest thing that I've seen, particularly over the last decade or so in ministry, is just the massive amount of biblical illiteracy that's running rampant in churches these days. And I think one of the fallback answers to that is just simply because nobody, and I want to say that again, there, there's been few people expounding the word correctly. I mean, it it doesn't take me very long. You know, we talked about before we got on here, I, I did a lot of evangelism. It doesn't take me very long when I walk into churches to find out which ones are probably healthy and which ones aren't, just simply based on what is the steady diet that they've been getting from the Word. What What is the pulpit driving here at this church? And like you said, for a lot of places, it's stories and it's emotionalism. And it's topic-based things that have nothing to do with Scripture, but it was a topic that was pre-chosen. And then we went finding a, a passage just to sort of drive in there. And it's it becomes that old adage, it's square peg into a round hole. And that's what people are trying to do. And I think what you end up seeing is extremely unhealthy places led by guys that are in a bad place themselves. But Yeah, I think, uh, and my pastor has always called it, felt needs preaching yeah. where you take whatever things people are going through and you find passages to fit that i mean you go you talk about family you talk about husband and wife relationships you talk about storms storms are really popular to preach on because yeah. you really don't need anything to back up what you're saying just find couple, take the jesus and the disciples in the boat uh crossing the red sea you can you could come up with a message these guys are preaching in the matter of anybody who's been who's read the Bible could come up with this stuff they're preaching. Yeah. Thing is, the guys who excel at it are really good performers, and they're really good on stages, and that's what makes it go over better because you can put them up there, and the way that they deliver is just phenomenal, really. I mean, it is. I mean, they're gifted in those things that they do, and I still believe a lot of them – originally don't intend to get to where they're at. Yeah. Meaning when they start out as young men, they really are passionate about what they're preaching. And I believe they are still passionate about, about ministry. But what happens is people create, uh, I think a lot of these things are creations of what people want. They want a guy that can fire them up. They want a guy that can get a hundred in the altar when he's done. Yeah. They want a guy who can have a breakout meeting everywhere he goes. So these guys become pressured to be that person, to, to do that everywhere they go. I mean, I feel like they live under a tremendous amount of stress at times. And they find out that it's actually easier just to give what is wanted as opposed to what is needed, I mean, as far as that goes. If all these things were true, these numbers that are reported and all these 
revival, and I believe revival is a real thing. I think we should be in a state of revival. We've probably been in places of revival. We don't even know what it really is because we don't know. We think it's something, it should look like something, and it's probably not what we think it looks like. But if all these things were true, these people that were converted, even the last six years, there should be certain districts of North Carolina and Tennessee that seen really massive church yeah. growth, or either churches popping up. Like, um, I think I looked online in like 2018, the size of an average Baptist church was uh, 100 people or 80 to 100 people across the United States. And if you're seeing 2,000 people saved in meetings in Burlington, in Greenville, in uh uh, there was another one in Bristol. Bristol. Uh, if, if you're seeing even a thousand people saved in those meetings, those churches, should, there should have been five, six churches come up. There's, those churches should have grown. The ones that were a part of that should have grown by numbers that are like crazy compared to what they normally see. Yeah. But the thing is, you go back and it's the same people and they're doing the same thing. And they there's, you know what I'm saying? There's no actual right. real visual change of what, and, and people say, well, you don't, he don't know that, you know, but I've talked to people that lived in Burlington and asked them what, you know, did y'all see any churches pop up there? And I was like, no, did you see the, the town? Did something change in the town for this meeting? And they're like, not really. I mean, outside, I mean, that don't make sense to me. You know, how did this, how did this go about? And I say that, it sounds like I'm picking on Burlington. I'm not. There's fine people there uh, and fine people that was a part of that meeting. I just think it is like it got out of hand or something. I mean, I yeah. just don't really know. I think people got so wrapped up. And I think that happens probably at, at any meeting. There, there's people that are genuinely saved, and then there's a whole host of people that just get caught up in it. And that, unfortunately, who who looks out for those people? Mm. Who, I mean, who does? Who's left to sweep up the the mess? What, who comes in? People like you that wants to plant a church goes into the area, and fifty people they talk to all got saved at this meeting. How do they how do they convince them? Because they've never followed Christ and believers baptism or joined a local assembly. How do you convince that person he's not saved when he was told at this meeting when he raised his hand he was right. saved? Right. You're fighting you're fighting a double battle. It'd be easier to walk up to a man who's never heard the gospel and say Jesus Christ cause you unto him to repentance i mean yeah it's 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 doing a lot of damage i think yeah one of the things that comes out of that and this is another point i want to look into is the celebrity culture of everything yes. uh, this is really growing and obviously we live in the 21st century and i don't want to be intellectually dishonest here you know because we're sitting here having a conversation with a ton of technology working right now right. in front of us and obviously that feeds into it you we touched on you know briefly mentioning billy graham obviously television and radio was a huge part of what he did and again nothing wrong with that in any way shape and form i'd be a you know as we've heard said a double barreled hypocrite if i said that and here i am <laughs> operating a, a podcast you know on social media so however the use of it, the motive behind it, the arrogance of it, and I think something that a lot of people are not aware of sometimes, the financial aspect of it that comes with this can be extremely dangerous. You touched on an individual, and I don't mind to drop his name here, but Greg Locke, who has basically become almost like a rock star in this sort of fundamentalist type movement. I mean, we're talking about a gentleman that's been on Fox News, uh, has a massive social media presence right now, um, garnering a lot of attention, big time events, preaching a lot in the Tennessee area, North Carolina, you know, Virginia. He was just in our neck of the woods recently. He was on the front page of our own paper um, for a meeting that they had. Talk a little bit about the dangers of what's become in this whole celebrity culture of some of these individuals. Well, it goes back to what I mentioned there at the beginning where, uh, you know, people like a Percy Ray, and a lot of people may not have never even heard of him, but he was, a, you know, a celebrity of the late 70s and 80s um, because of his touch of God that he had on his life, you know. 
And I went back and listened to some things that he said and read where he's seen visions and things uh, that I think are just completely goofball out there in yeah. the far left field. Like, I don't, I wouldn't even, even the circle I grew up in would have been like, what is he talking about? So people were doing it back then, but they didn't have the platform that they have now. So guys like Greg Locke, um, you know, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, he was disqualified from his position yeah. as a pastor. Yeah. He's not disqualified from being a Christian or being a, being a, he could preach, and I guess, in certain settings, but to lead a flock, uh, he's, as far as I'm concerned, disqualified. Bingo, yeah. Um, so that in and of itself is the main problem. But then because he is so charismatic in his personality and his boldness in his, I mean, he would lead you to believe he'd be ready to fist fight anybody right outside the tent. Oh, yeah. You know? yeah. I mean, just, just in the way he carries himself. Um, but in, in the same like you talk about what is the actual danger of that. The danger of it is, for me, is or what I think is, that he is so pro-American, pro-Republican, that he can make those posts, draw people in with that, give them a false sense of security in a profession, or that this is actually the gospel. That I'm, He would make you think he's there for Jesus, but the whole time all he's doing is promoting Greg Locke in America. Sure. Okay? Behind everything, he's promoting himself. Yeah. That, that, and he... But he actually tells you he's not promoting himself, but he is promoting himself. Listen to what's said over and over and over. I had no idea that God was going to use me, that God was going to use this. And what he's saying is he's basically built this whole church on his own efforts yeah. and that God's just taking it and use it and just blessing him. Uh, most people who tell you how much God's blessing them, usually I don't think God's blessing them. I think they're they're just... They're good at what they do. I mean, there's always been someone in every generation that is good at what they do. Right. I mean, and he was really good. I think his really big mark came, I think, when he went online and blasted Target for um, having the, the male and female restrooms together some yeah. years ago. That was kind of his hit. You know, he used to throw those little three-minute videos on Facebook, and just it just blew up because he was saying things that fundamental Republican Christians believe. You yeah. know, and that's what, you know, I agree with that. You know, I hear him say, I can agree with that. I mean, I'm not going to go out and stand in the Target parking lot and, <laughs> and fuss at him like it, like it makes a difference. And I'm not going to like his his page for just for that. But you get sucked into it, and then you got a guy, the next thing you know, he's telling you that you and your children can cast out demons. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, uh, you know, he'll say, he, he's on this big kick right now that Jesus... Uh, spent three-fourths of his ministry casting out demons, so you can too. Well, Jesus raised people from the dead. Can you do that too? Bingo, yeah. You can't You can't take one instance, and he's, you know, he, he got, they got so upset. I think this demon casting out stuff, and I don't mean to keep dwelling on him, but you just brought it up, but the demon casting stuff is what he did to take the attention off of when he said autism was a byproduct of being uh, possessed by a demon. Yes, and his his argument was that Jesus never diagnosed anyone with autism. That's what he actually said. Yeah. He said, "Right, Jesus never diagnosed anyone with autism." Well, Jesus never diagnosed people with any. I mean, he he didn't come up to someone and say, "I feel like you've got a ninety percent blockage in your heart." I mean, he could heal that person, but he didn't diagnose particular things. If you're going to take that, I mean, it was not an argument. Say, he went beyond the bounds of scripture yeah. and said something out of the way that was actually pretty harmful and hurtful to people who deal with autism and deal with ADHD and all those other things that kids Absolutely. deal with. Sure. Who wouldn't agree that probably in our society kids are given a pass a lot of times that probably just need some good discipline, but that don't mean the kids uh, possessed or oppressed by a demon. Right. Right. I mean, I don't, you know, and he, he tries, and he, and you know, he's up there pointing at people and daring people to come down there and talk to him. Well, you couldn't argue with the man because he's always right. There's no way, there's no way you could prove a point to him. And if people think a, that this isn't something that's a big deal, they say, well, that's just one guy out there in the wilderness. Well, folks, there are thousands and thousands of people listening to this man, following him, flocking sure. to every meeting he's got. Again, we're talking about an individual that was was on Fox News. I mean, he's been on national television speaking these things for 
years, like you said, um, false prophecies. I mean, you've even shared that on your own account there of the times that he's been caught, you know, trying to publicly say that so and so is going to get back in office, this, that, and the other, this thing's going to happen on this date, and totally untrue, completely missed the mark altogether on those things. And instead of repenting, backtracking and trying to weasel his way out of that in some weird way. And like you said, it seems like now what's being, and I'm going to use this term very loosely, preached from where he's at is just simply some cover-up for what has been done. Um, I have on multiple occasions had conversations with people about what you just mentioned on the autism. Individuals that you don't know, we've never spoke about, that were dumbfounded by what he said and were extremely offended. People that have worked in that field with individuals with learning disabilities. You know, I'm a school teacher by trade. I see that a lot. Um, and to make light of that and, and to twist scripture in that regard, um, there was a lot of people that I spoke with extremely upset by that. And yet here he is, thousands and thousands and thousands of people later still hammering down on this with zero repentance. I mean, it's really sad. Yeah, I want to say that the night he burned uh, Harry Potter and uh, which is a Waverly Place memorabilia, I want to say he had ten or 12,000 people yeah. watching yeah. online. Now, granted, you know, there was probably a few thousand anonymous accounts going there for the clips, but, I mean, uh, it, it was still, like, I, I remember logging on looking at that, and I thought, God, there's this many people that are actually, and it was pretty, you looked in the comments, a lot of them were pro what he was doing, yeah, yeah. you know, um, and those, like that thing, even that burning, I mean, that's something they were doing back in the 80s, burning Metallica records, and, and he just, in my opinion, he just did all that to make you look over here because he'd done something on the other side, you know, not, not to, and, you know, he, he'll he never hear this as far as I get, I mean, I wouldn't think so, but, you know, I don't have any hatred for the guy, but man, it, it, it really, it really made me mad when I seen that autism thing because, uh, you know, you know, everybody knows someone who's dealt with that. And then you see videos and stuff like on Facebook or whatever. I think I seen one of the kid with autism who'd got some train horns for Christmas or something that he wanted. And you watch the kid like that who, who it, you know, is going to struggle their whole life just to, to get by yeah. and, and and to make it someone's going to have to care and to help and to be a give of themselves sacrifice and then for a guy to be so bold as to get up and say you need to bring your kid up here and let me pray over him to get this demon out of him that's basically what he's yeah. saying without yeah. saying it. he's he's pronouncing this is a demonic influence let me pray let me pray that's what he's saying let let me or my wife or my team pray over you and get this out and uh I don't think he has any biblical. Now he, sure, there is plenty of biblical text to go through where there were demons cast out. But like I said earlier, if you're going to read it that way, then by all means, raise someone from the dead because Jesus did that too. Yeah. You, 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 these things are not just what you pick and choose just because it's there means that it's available to do right now. Are there is there demon, demonic oppression? Sure, I mean we know that they're here on the earth with us, but. Does it look like what he's doing? I highly doubt it. I really do. I mean, you know, even he made references in one of his messages. He said, this ain't flip upside down, spin, head spinning around uh, movie type scenes. But then the next message, he talked about a guy get falling down on the floor and screaming and rolling around and his wife or kid hit putting a Bible on him or something. Hmm. So he was basically contradicting himself saying, this isn't like the movies, but I'm going to tell you a story the next time that sounds like the movies. You know, I mean, it's just, if you listen to these guys enough, they tell them themselves. You know, their their facts won't line up with one another. Uh, that's what Mr. Kid does a lot. He'll he'll tell this story, and eventually it comes around. You're like, that wasn't how you told it the first time. And that may happen with a lot of preachers. Sometimes they just get confused, I think. But Or you tell the same story out week after week, yeah. you could get you know what do they call it there's something they call that uh pastoral liberty or something or you know taking liberty with their story but yeah but i mean to your to your question or to the whole point of all this is it's it's scary because i don't know when where does it stop i mean yeah when do people wake next, up you know that's my question like when do people wake up and really see this for what it is and what's going on yeah. here 
And that sort of leads me to the last thing I wanted to talk about. Like, and you you briefly uh, caught this a little bit, but the disqualification factors here. I mean, if you go back and legitimately read Titus 1, 1 Timothy 3, and were honest to the text and looked at these individuals like we've talked about, and there's others, like, I mean, we've just named a few, but like there are plenty of others. The honest Christian would have to say many of these individuals, not disqualified from being Christian, I think you said that well, but certainly disqualified from pastoral ministry. Sure. And are continuing on in congregations of people allowing it. And my, my other question is, where are the congregational members? Where are these other elders, deacons, however their church is set up? Where are these other people holding their feet to the fire of the Bible? And I just don't see it. I, it's very sad. Like you mentioned, you know, one individual, like, blatantly disqualified for things that have happened in previous years in his life. And yet zero remorse for that, just completely plows down on it. And then you see this other stuff in their life as well. I mean, the Bible clearly talks about adultery, fighting, uh, loving money, these things that are clearly disqualifiers. And it would be one thing if this happened one time. For example, like there was a scene of, of anger or something. But we're talking about habitual sin here for not just a few months, but years and decades worth of so-called ministry that I just, I, I do not understand how people have not called this to the light yet. I don't either. Uh, and I mean, those are, that's, that's a wonderful point um, because when you weigh all that out, you know, not apt to fight, that was one of the things like, in that tech, in that there, the right, ruler cool. of their own home. Yeah. Uh, yeah, all those things that these guys are blatantly from the pulpit, they are. Yes. I mean, blatantly just. And then I believe to go even far, or further, you can edit that out, to go even even deeper into that. Let me start that ever edit, edit that <laughs> out. <laughs> My tongue got tied. Uh, or you can leave it in there. Um, but I think to go even deeper into that is how narcissistic these guys yes, are beyond. Yes. Okay. So there's some that will say really ugly things, but I believe there's even more who will act out even more ugly things toward the people that are under them. Mm. And, and I know this happens because you mentioned what are the leaders doing under these guys, whether they're uh, deacon led or elder led, the, the plurality of leadership or the sing, singularness of leadership. These guys run from, a one position, I'm the pastor, everybody's under me. Yeah. Which is not biblical no. at all. And that creates the environment for these guys to feed their egos right. and to feed what they want to do. And the way that that was established, I think, come out of preaching, this come from preaching in the 70s, 80s, and 90s of not questioning the man of God. Yeah. You cannot question the man of God. If you question the man of God, you got a bitter spirit can't touch my anointed you're going to die god's going to strike you dead and they've supported each other with that type of preaching and it is unbiblical and it has hurt the church and created places for these guys to exercise their gifts and not really minister to anyone that's basically what's happened yeah in my opinion um and it is it's so it's just so dangerous through and they and they and they're afraid i mean you could go around to probably any even these little country churches to an extent and say, you know, what do you think would happen if you said something to the preacher? Well, he'd probably make an example of me from the pulpit mm. or he'd probably tell so-and-so. They live in fear of things, yeah. Uh, yeah. you know, being said about them or feel like even if they wondered what was going on, they couldn't go to their preacher and be like, you know, I think you maybe didn't get that text right today where you said two or three are gathered in his name. Is that not about church discipline? They go, <laughs> no, that's about if two people show up, you know, yeah. we're going to have God in the house. Well, you know, he had a valid point to come to the, to the preacher and say, this text is not what you represented it as. That don't mean that he hates his preacher. That sure. don't mean that he wants to run him off. It should be that there's a group of elders or men that say, a uh, pastor, Maybe we should look at this text together, and if you missed it or we missed it, then we can all be together on this, whatever's right. wrong. But no, they've turned it into 
you know, touch not mine anointed, you're going to die. I mean, there's people probably think I'm, I should fall over dead any day now because I've went against God's men. But, uh, through everything I've done on the account, however much longer it lasts, I've never lied on anyone. Uh, everything that's posted is their own words. Okay. Right. I mean, whether they say I take them out of context or you can't hear context in a three minute clip or two minute, 20 second clip. No, you can't, uh, but I'll be glad to point you to the whole thing and you can go listen to it. I mean, I don't know how I can how I can misrepresent someone either that bad in two minutes and 20 seconds. You know what I'm saying? Right. I mean, how, how could I that bad misrepresent what was said if, you know, I've condensed certain clips from 15 minutes down to three, taking the points that they were they were rolling through. And, um, and if I missed it somewhere, I would gladly – apologize for that as far as like this guy said this but i mean i've posted clips where guys tell about it's in their opinion you know that the the angels are up there painting sheetrock with uh, angel dust or something stupid i mean and and, and, and they're just saying these things and just throwing it out there for feel good type services and they're like well you took that out of context well i, I he said it i didn't yeah, say that right. i mean i did not get and i did not take clips of him saying this and put it with this to make him say the Virgin Mary was not actually a virgin or Jesus wasn't virgin. But I never, I would never do anything like that. And, but I post, if I do say something about someone, whether it be questioning them or put it out there for you to question what you're being exposed to, you know, I'm the bitter one or I'm the one who's got the problem. I'm the one who's wasting my time doing this. And I'm the one who's, you know, that's that's always been the the critical point, or I'm the coward for hiding behind an anonymous account or whatever it may be. Well, I've told people for years, no one listens. If you went to these people, if I went to these people that I posted and said, "Sir, you know, I've got a real issue with you calling people and praying them and telling them that, praying for them and telling them they're saved," they just shrug it off and go on. Yeah. How else do you get it spread? How else do you warn people? Or how else do you? I know they're going. To, I can hear them now. There's, there's probably people just, <laughs> if somebody listens to this that really can't stand me, they're either like, well, the brother should go to the brother and, and, and do that. And, you know, I've made myself available for these people, the ones that have had the biggest issue with me to call me if they yeah. want to talk. Um, but I really don't think they're interested in changing anything like that. They're not. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, whether I'm in the wrong or not on that, pray God shows me. But uh, I just, you know, your whole point of this combo and what I what I've done and what now I am ge- ge- generally geared toward stupidity. I mean, as far as <laughs> com- I mean, I look at things, you know, uh, especially growing up, like stuff that happened in church or testimonies of weird stuff or preachers. Like right now, my big kick is with fuel prices. I don't know when this will air, but whenever this airs, gas is four dollars a gallon or whatever. Um, I love for a preacher to get on there and complain about it, and he's not paying for his gas. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you know, I mean, yeah. that's so silly. What would he be complaining about? He's driving, and not everybody. I mean, you're you're bivocational, and yeah. a lot of these people that that like what I do usually are. They're on the other end of the spectrum where they're not getting paid a salary, a love offering, a fuel allowance. Their tires bought, their cell phone paid for, their insurance paid for, everything that they want is not pro- provided. So it, I'm sure to, to everybody on that side, when I make a post like that, they find it amusing and they find it very true. Right. Even it's, it's parody. You know, it's like, well, you know, why if things are getting tight. I'm going to call for another revival. You know, I mean, that's that, <laughs> you know, that's, that's where my mind usually is. It's not always, I'm not always discouraged when I see certain things, but yet when these big, big meetings break out, and I start seeing these ridiculous uh, sermon topics and these uh, blown up bears and devil playing chess with people and guys dressed up like the devil dressed in chains. And I see this ridiculous stuff going on. I get really, what is it? I call it righteous indigestion, but it's, <laughs> it's, it gets me really angry. Yeah. I mean, because I, that's the God I believe in that he's trying to portray. That's where I put my faith and trust. And, and these people are making it out to be 
white suits with somebody painting red stripes on them in yeah. front of people and saying this is it, it's no joke there that that does make me angry it makes me want to to say something about it um right or wrong in that area that's the way i feel about that uh, and i'm glad you're willing to talk about it or or at least i know you are for your area too concerned that people not be easily so easily beguiled by these things or or fooled by them right yeah, on that note, uh, we're going to close out here on this last question because I know you got to get back to that Piggly Wiggly revival real bad. So, uh, <laughs> well, we've had two offerings to take since we started, so <laughs> I, I've told them to leave the lights on and we'd count for a while. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm just going to leave you with this one just for our audience since we've covered a lot of material here today. But quickly, just however you want to phrase this, what advice or wisdom would you give to our listeners as far as how to approach this issue, and and mainly I want to phrase it this way. Let's say somebody is in one of these churches or in a type of church like that. What would your advice be to those individuals or those families? Well, I mean, that's a tough question because I, I really don't feel qualified to advise anyone uh, about their where they attend church. I mean, I, I, like I said earlier, I've got friends that do not agree with my viewpoint or even my approach to uh, how I've handled some things with these these people that I believe are, are, are given kind of a, it's not a false gospel, but it, it's a shallow gospel yeah. in, in, a, in a sense. Um, so, I mean, I, I think there's a problem if you're already attending there. I mean, there's some people maybe would hear this that are that are wanting out. And uh, I mean, if you have any, if you've ever been under solid teaching or preaching, I doubt you'd be comfortable in these positions. Right. So if you're just hearing this for the first time and you're like, you're confused, uh, I mean, it would be sound advice to get out. I think that's the best sound advice I could give you if you're a part of any of these things. Um, Because you'll not be able to go to these men and address the issues. Just forget it. It's not going to happen. I mean... They could care less. Two families, ten, twenty. I mean, you've heard, you've seen me post clips of these guys. Yeah. All the way across the board, five or six guys I posted. If you don't like, the, if you don't like what I do, there's the door. Yeah. Which again is another unbiblical thing. There's no pastor should right. say that from the pulpit, um, whether they're amped up or whatever it may be. But yeah, I mean, if you're just hearing this for the first time and you're following one of these guys and you're a part of that, uh, my first suggestion would be to immediately quit going to that place uh, for the sake of you and if you have children and then try to expose yourself to some sort of solid teaching somewhere or solid preaching I would go if you're if you've been in this kind of stuff go find something completely opposite if you think mm-hmm. this is alive and, and busting at the seams go find something dead and dry where there's some man preaching straight through the text every week Expose yourself to that and see what happens from that point. Uh, because there, I believe there's probably deeper issues. I ain't saying these people ain't saved that go to these churches, but it's a it's a big change from someone who rightly divides verse line upon line as to what the top stuff we've been talking about tonight. It's just a huge difference. Yeah, I mean it wouldn't it wouldn't settle. So here again, I'm not the final authority on that, um, and I wouldn't. <laughs> I don't know if I'd trust myself for much advice anyway, but I would suggest getting on out of there as quickly as possible. Or at yeah. least talk to somebody. I mean, they could reach out to you. Uh, and I talk to lots of people. I mean, I, I'll talk to anyone that wants to send me a, a message on the Twitter account or whatever. I mean, there's lots of guys I talk with daily, and there's people that ask, there's people that ask me stuff that I, I don't know. I mean, I really do not know. If I was in that position, I really honestly don't know. If I seen the truth of things, I probably would get out. But if you're kind of in between, it might be good to uh, to reach out to someone. Like on, I mean, there's lots of good guys on Twitter that uh, would be willing to talk and not try to persuade you right. to what they think. Yeah. And I've, I don't ever want to be that. I don't want to be like, just because I think this, you should do this. I mean, you should always have good, solid Bible teaching and scripture to tell you which way to go. Yeah. Follow that. Yeah, I agree. A high view of the Bible, uh, absolutely. And, and just a good yeah. understanding of what it's called us to be and and where to be, you know, for that matter. So, yeah. 
Man, I appreciate you being on. He is at the Loving Pastor on Twitter. If you haven't went on there and followed him, if you don't have a Twitter account, uh, you're missing out on some really interesting times. I'll tell you that. But definitely get on there, give him a follow. I promise you, if nothing else, you're going to get a good laugh out of it. And like he said, you know, you can reach out to him. I know he wouldn't mind to help in any way he can. You can do that for yeah, us as well. Then, so. I'll send, uh, they can send me stuff through PayPal or <laughs> Venmo. <laughs> <laughs> I take money orders or yeah. cash. Checks made order. out to the Piggly Wiggly <laughs> Revival. Yeah, all that. Yeah, I saw where you were looking for, uh, what was a new vehicle now because of the gas prices, right? So <laughs> Yeah, well, we put it, we, we got a new van, ministry van last night at the church, but through Deacon Arnold, he gave us a hard time about it, but we got it put through, and we've added uh, an extra hundred onto my gas allowance per week, yeah. and then so we're going to buy that pontoon boat to try to do some crusades out on the lake. About around July, we're going to start doing some lake crusades. Yeah. So you can buy tickets to that. They'll be a hundred dollars a piece. You can come out there, and I'll <laughs> preach a sermon, and take a love offering, and take you back. So I guess the campground <laughs> ministry is running up and well again, right? <laughs> The what now? The campground ministry you all ran last year. Oh, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah the campground ministry is doing good. And we had that Petro revival, when, you know, when they shut the fuel line down, the pipeline down. <laughs> we had that Petro revival and got it back up and going. We ain't really decided what we're going to do right now, <laughs> right now with the high fuel problem. It's probably just best to receive another love offering and go on. That's That's probably the best bet. Yeah, that's about all you can do in these hard times yeah. like you are facing. So. <laughs> and, and let me apologize to everyone who's listened to me. I'm I'm a redneck, you know. I mean, I've got a real bad southern draw. So uh, for everyone who listened, if you listen to this whole thing, I'm sorry you had to hear me speak this long. <laughs> well, they've listened to me for 100 episodes. So if they've made it that far, I promise you, your <laughs> accent's no worse than mine. So. But, I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm, what is it? I'm like one... I don't have a tattoo, but if I had a tattoo and a mullet, I'd be full blown redneck. Yeah. <laughs> and if I had some beer in the fridge, I'd be a Calvinist. <laughs> <laughs> well, on that, Governor, we'll leave everybody on that one. But, uh, yeah. Again, man, I appreciate you being on. Thank you for staying up late. I know most people won't know this. We're recording pretty late tonight just for schedule purposes. So, again, appreciate you being on, brother. And uh, thank you for your ministry. I know you're, you're welcome. having a good time on there, and, and we are too. But I appreciate your bold stance, and, and it's much needed. You know, I don't think people appreciate that well enough. So I'll say thank you on behalf of a lot of people that have benefited from it. But, hey, again, if you haven't done so, YouTube, Apple Podcast, head on over there, hit that subscribe button. You can find us on our website, deeplyrootedpodcast.com, and go on over as well and find us on our Facebook group page. Email us at drigw18 at gmail.com if you have any questions, prayer requests. Or after this episode, maybe you just want to get mad at us and fire away. We'll receive that too. So... (laughs) Until next time, guys, we love you. Hope you have a great week in Jesus.